All right, how's my audio coming through? That sounds good. Perfect. No problem. Well, Knut, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. I was uh, recently listening to um, your book, Sovereignty Through Mathematics, uh, done by Guy Swan at the Crypto Economy. Big shout out to Guy. Big fan. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's really great. It was funny. It was a, I think it was a Friday night. I think I'm starting to realize how much a loner, of a loner I am, but uh, or have turned <laughs> come, turned into. But um, I was sitting at home waiting for my friends to respond. We were going to go out to dinner or something like that. But everybody was super busy, and so I broke into the the book. It was done in five five parts, uh, and it was great. You know, another big shout out to Guy because not only did he read the book, yeah, there it is, and then he. He provides his commentary, which is always, always very much appreciated and interesting. But anyways, I was sitting at home in the living room. It was kind of in the dark, and I was just like, it was super quiet. No, nobody around. Friday night at like eight o'clock, and I was just had guy in my ears listening to your book, and I, I, you know, I just had a big smile on my face, like that. Eh, this is perfect. I don't mind spending my Friday <laughs> night this way at all. <laughs> oh, that's so. Super cool for me to hear. <laughs> so uh, there's, I got a lot for you, uh, Knut, but I think maybe even before we get to the story of how you know all this came to be, maybe you could just tell me, and I know this is a very big question, so you can handle it however you like, but what do you mean by sovereignty through mathematics? Why is that the title of your book, and what did you hope to achieve by framing your book in that way? A very good question. Uh, I had a working title for the book, uh, which I can't remember right now. Um, anyway, it was quite a lame title, so I needed a new title. <laughs> uh, uh, de uh, dealing with Bitcoin, that was a working title. Yeah, that's no good. And uh, uh, <laughs> No, it's not good at all. Sovereignty through mathematics, though, I'm, I'm really uh, happy with that because uh, people seem to like that title, and I do too, so... Uh, it it's it sort of fits in with the whole uh, atheist narrative there in the second chapter also. Like this is this is something you can verify, um, and uh, yeah, sovereign through you through mathematics. How how to how to stay in control or how to regain control of your own life uh, through mathematics basically through logic and communication mm -hmm. one of the we're, we'll jump around all over the place so don't you know you can take it wherever you want but one of the <clears throat> um, interesting concepts that you know I think you outlined in your book and that is talked about a lot in this space is um, the relationship between speech and violence you know and free speech and hate speech and all this stuff is a big uh, issue in today's society and uh, people seem to be thinking the less hate, you know, quote unquote hate speech or the less speech generally, the less violence. And I think it's probably more appropriate to say the less speech, the more violence. And yeah. um, that makes me think about, you know, violence and law in many different ways. And Bitcoin is obviously this network and this entity that seems like if it's able to play out the way we are hoping and, and, and trying to foster it playing out, that it, it will probably uh, disintermediate some forms of, of law, right? Because you may not, you, you know, just for a very simple example, you may not need, need protection from the state to avoid violence if you're able to be sovereign and be able to secure your own wealth in this in this case so yeah what what in your you know when we're talking about sovereignty through mathematics obviously an element of sovereignty is safety right so f you know freedom from uh physical violence what is the relationship yeah. in your mind between speech mathematics and <laughs> the role of violence and law in society big question again a very big question and a lot a lot to take in there and lots to think about. Uh, first of all, m mathematics is a form of communication. So mathematics is uh, connected to speech. It does also reflect reality. Uh, I mean, it's connected to the real world. 
uh, in the sense that it's it's just logic basically uh, and you can come to conclusions by uh, thinking in logical ways uh, and you can communicate that uh, and use that to uh, how shall I put this um, to empower yourself uh, that's a very powerful tool and it might be even more powerful than tools for violence such as guns or batons or whatever mm -hmm. uh, imagine just just to give an example of this it sounds sort of abstract but uh, in an airport where you have a lot of armed guards and uh, customer uh, customs officers that uh, uh, are uh, armed and so on and you have to go through the, all these machines and you can only bring this or that amount of currency uh, from uh, across a border from one country to another but you can keep value in your head now you can have a brain wallet and remember 24 words and therefore by by simply using mathematics in and language uh, and your memory uh, you can bypass all that and no one can ever know uh, uh, unless they torture every citizen they find for information i mean to to um to actually prove that someone owns Bitcoin requires, will probably require a lot of violence and mm -hmm. and really nasty behavior. So, the, I think this technology sort of puts a finger on uh, that there's something wrong with the current narrative about uh, nation states and governments, and we we, we put too much trust in them, uh, uh, just like we probably put too much uh, trust in religious institutions a couple of hundred years ago the nation state have sort of taken over that role and everyone is brainwashed in the same way so we all we all uh, see it as something natural rather than seeing it as a big cult that very few uh, dare to reject and uh, uh, money is at the very core of that because it's the ling linguistic tool we use in order to express value to each other. And as long as that tool is controlled by someone, that someone controls the narrative and uh, controls the collective hallucination that is the nation state. I mean, there's reality and there's fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a, a large part of what human progress is, is that uh, uh, what makes us uh, an exceptional primate is that we're able to do collective hallucinations on massive scales, like uh, a, a flock of chimpanzees couldn't uh, form a nation or muster an army or anything like that because they cannot structure themselves themselves in groups of over 150 individuals or something like that whilst we can have groups with several million individuals that buy into the same story and the same narrative and uh, therefore religions and nation states and all this have historically been very powerful uh, mechanisms for humanity as a whole to get ahead but if you're an individual in one of those powerful entities and big social things, you might want the option to drop out of whatever aspect of it. And sovereignty through mathematics, that is like you, you can opt out of every system uh, to different levels. Like you can stop watching national television and get a, a, a more personal feed, which many view as... Uh, a bubbly thing to do. I think it's rather the opposite. The the more personalized the get, it gets, the more selective you can be. And uh, instead of being spoon-fed all all the news and so, and uh, now with Bitcoin we can take that one step further. We don't even have to buy into the monetary narrative. Yeah, I think a Making lot of sense. Absolutely, and I, I think a lot of. 
Bitcoiners especially, and more and more people uh, all around the world these days, were aware of, you know, to use your term, the kind of brainwashing and the various narratives um, and coercive behaviors and man manipulative behaviors in various industries and uh, uh, entities around the world. But I think everyone just felt that because the the control of the the primary lever of power, which is the money and the money supply, was controlled by those same groups more or less that nothing could be done about it. And this was the hopelessness that I've often referred to on the podcast that I felt and I know many people that I speak to have felt. And that is also also why Bitcoin provides a hopefulness because it first time represents an, uh, an, a, a tool and an ability to attack the problem at its roots, at its foundations. And if, if that yeah. If that can be changed at source, if that b battle can be won on that level, then all the different manifestations that stem from that should either be solved or greatly improved. And I think that is one of the primary hopes of Bitcoin is that if we can if we can, you know, win that one major battle, then a lot of other things downstream will be improved dramatically. Yeah, precisely. And I, I think to most people, this this is a mental leap that is too huge for them to make. I mean, they, very few people have the imagination to think outside the box when it comes to money or nations or laws or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, well, as, uh, is, you, as you is have, often said, you have to be at least somewhat familiar with, and I guess also somewhat concerned with the nature and the scale of the issues, you know? So, uh, mm. You know, when I was uh, an er in my early 20s, you know, and I'm not trying to, to pump myself up just to say kind of the variety of information that I was getting. I was reading books about, you know, uh, industrial farming practices and the pharmaceutical lobby and APAC and, uh, you know, what happens at the FDA and what happens at the Federal Reserve. And, of course, you're not getting pure truth when you consult these resources. You're getting somebody's perspective on, on what may have happened or is going on currently. But yeah. at least it, it, it's, you start to piece together, you know, a little bit more clarity around what may be happening around the world. Um, and so I think if you have that, First of all, if you have the curiosity to try to figure that out a little bit, and then if you have, you've started to, to build together some information and some knowledge and some insights around that stuff, then the, the necessity and the curiosity for something like Bitcoin is, is a very probably easy and short leap. But if, if, if you haven't put that kind of, if you haven't contextualized a broader view of the world and how it operates, yep. then you're looking into something like Bitcoin is going to seem so irrelevant. It's going to seem so... Like how is it related and why is it even absurd? Important? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, there's a lot, lot of truth there, and I think, like, like I said before, uh, our our ability to have these collective hallucinations has helped us uh, greatly uh, ev in an evolutionary sense, mm -hmm. and therefore I I think it's very hard to to think outside the box when it comes to thinking outside our own collective programming so so to speak we're we're uh, we have historically uh, especially if you look far back gained a lot from being able to fall for all of the all of these false premises yeah. and uh, to to uh, to question that and to to question everything is really necessary to to grasp the 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 real long-term impact that this absolute scarcity might have yeah. uh, on and our I, language. And I'd like to discuss that, but before we move off the, <clears throat> excuse me, sovereignty through mathematics and its kind of relationship to violence and law and stuff. <laughs> um, Since we're doing video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, plug in the book. Um, what I think what I I'm not sure if I I read it in one of your articles on Medium or Hacker Noon or if it was in fact in a, a part of the book, but um, I think you said something along the lines of that. In the physical world, violence is incentivized because the the imposing of violence can uh, reward the person who's 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 doing it basically so like you know yep. if i have a bar of gold and you want it if you your violence yep. against me is incentivized because you get the value that i have if you can coerce me through violence 
And so that... Or if I, or if I have a police force, uh, I can tax you. Right. So, so it works on every level, police force, state, yeah. individual, everything like that. And so one of the interesting, again, back to that theme of sovereignty through mathematics, that provides, that kind of disincentivizes violence against people if your wealth and uh, is being held in that form, because just because you can exert violence over, over me, I'm not saying you, you couldn't access that, that wealth or value, let's say, but it makes it far more difficult to do so. And so, you know, I was getting a little bit cosmic with this thought and I was thinking, will that, and obviously Bitcoin is, is not only, you know, it exists in the digital world, but we, we use it very much in the, in the physical world and we interact with other people in the physical world. But as we move further into a, a digital existence, you know, as social media and media generally and our financial lives and everything is kind of consumed by software and, and digitally, do you think that the violence will be, um, the, the physical realm is at risk of becoming more violent if it continues to be degraded and the people that hang on to that sort of perspective and operating exclusively in that world and then the digital realm and, and we and you know people that are more peaceful may move into a digital realm or you know what I'm trying to say there do you see that as like a di a, a bifurcation yeah. that may take place uh, I I haven't given this uh, enough thought I think but uh, basically you can you can view uh, Bitcoin as a weapon of peace, if that makes any sense. Like, uh, uh, y you can empower yourself without having to resort to violence. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a a a a loaded type of speech in uh, to express value with, and uh, you can you can l leverage that. And what that will do on larger scales, I mean, this whole citadel. Uh, a meme that's going on uh, that's connected to that because I think violence between people who are not yet who have not yet liberated themselves or like opted out of different layers of society uh, violence might increase there uh, and but I think if you if you have Bitcoin and if you hold Bitcoin and if it works, uh, the price will go up and everyone who holds Bitcoin will have more influence, more money, more power, whatever, and uh, that in turn will put more and more clever and more and more peaceful and peace-loving, more humane people in, in more uh, and more thinking people in more powerful positions. Uh, all over the world and that's that is a force for good mm -hmm. uh, i think the uh, the mechanisms that that sort of uh, lures people into bitcoin uh that you need this curiosity that you need this uh, the type of mind that is ready to question uh, uh coercive violence in whatever form it comes uh empowering that segment of the population is obviously a good thing, an overall good thing. Uh, it might uh, make some of the more violent actors show their true colors along the way, and that is a scary thought. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the long run, I think it's a good thing. And do you think the um, well? Do do you think that that will be kind of obvious in the future? And how do you see the existing establishment? Um, referring to, to put it lightly, or potentially vilifying Bitcoin and the people that engage with it as things deteriorate in the legacy system, assuming that they do. How do you see that playing out? Uh, depends on where and when. Uh, hopefully, uh, there's a peaceful transition. Mm -hmm. This is, by the way, uh, if... Bitcoin works. We don't. We, we don't know that yet. We don't have enough data. There might be a flaw somewhere. It might all break down like a house of cards. Uh, we don't know that yet. It has worked for ten years, almost flawlessly, but we don't know if it will work in the long run. And like, I think there are some attack vectors that might actually be harmful to it. But what are if they? it 
works, which is the like if an alt coin should take over as the number one coin. I think that's an underrated attack vector because then you undermine the whole digital scarcity or absolute scarcity aspect of it. Like I think we have one shot at this absolute scarcity on the internet since uh, an infinite amount of copies can be created, but it can only be if if we don't frame the scarcity around one specific thing, then there's no scarcities and there's no point to to uh, to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies uh, at all. I don't believe there's any point to other cryptocurrencies because I think scarcity is the only thing, the only th thing that gives it value. Mm -hmm. Just like I have the analogy with Da Vinci paintings in the book. Yeah. Uh, that there are there are a few things that are scarce in the world, but they're only scarce when framed in that way. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci paintings are only molecules and atoms, and there are <laughs> as many of those as, as you can imagine. But framed in a certain way, they become extremely valuable, and it's the same thing with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. oh, where was I? I lost lost my train of thought there. I, I lost think. it too. Sorry for interrupting. You. <laughs> uh, no. But I just I couldn't help but ask what you thought were kind of the existential threats to Bitcoin, because I always find that to be uh, an interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that that was the side track. Yeah, yeah, I know. Any, uh, anyway, the uh, the speech thing. It, it also connects to this uh, new atheist movement, and both Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris has been onto this a lot. Like, uh, uh, there's that humans have but two ways of resolving conflict, and the one uh, one is speech, and the other is violence. At at its core, only speech and violence can uh, uh, can resolve conflict. I, I can either uh, convince you by talking to you or uh, convincing you by talking to you with the gun pointed at your head. That's the only two options I have. Right, and if that's true, then that's kind of what I was re referring to before, right? Less speech, more violence, more speech, less violence, if we take that exactly. assumption as being true. Exactly, and right. in that sense, I think, uh, like, having a well-functioning, uh, truthful way of expressing value to each other can only be done by connecting that uh, I mean value is entirely subjective this is also a point from the book as I view it uh, and what I've learned from uh, Austrian thinkers and like from von Mises and such and Hayek and uh, Rothbard like uh, Demand is always subjective, like value, what we find valuable is always subjective. Subjective to an individual, subjective to a point in time, always subjective. Uh, but values can also be derived from supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Supply uh, is the objective part of it and demand is the subjective part of it. So like, uh, and Bitcoin is right now the only thing we know that has an absolutely scarce supply. Uh, and that can also be teleported through time and space uh, without uh, any major hassle. Mm -hmm. And that makes it extremely special and uh, a very rare black swan event that we should treasure and study and try to like uh, hold as uh, dear as we can. I mean... <laughs> And I think many of us do, but let me play devil's advocate for a second, right? So please do. Let's say, you know, because you said an underrated attack vector would be, a, you know, an, uh, an altcoin. So let's say another coin comes along and it's got the same, uh, you know, engine. The scarcity is built in. It's got the same supply cap, but it's better on privacy. It's, you know, somehow it's better. I, I can't really, yeah, I can't really imagine what that would be. But let's just say it's better. Why? Yeah. Because a part of, of Bitcoin, um, that, that framing that you mentioned, right? Part of Bitcoin's framing is our, our social consensus to say we are going to maintain it as X, Y, Z because we want it to be that way, right? That's the consensus element of it. Yeah. So and what, like what, what would stop if, uh, you know, another coin from coming along from from having that same kind of framing around it. Look at it this way. Uh, if another coin 
uh, takes over and gets a bigger market cap, people move over to that coin. Then there's there's really nothing uh, to to stop yet another coin from doing the, that same thing to that coin once again and again and again and again and again, and all of a sudden you have a chain of new coin. Uh, there's no scarcity anymore. Because, like, uh, for but instance, scarcity if, in the in the in the terms of that the social consensus is still only choosing one at a time. I mean, I totally understand your yeah. point, but the, yeah, but okay, let me clarify that a bit. Uh, if I hold Bitcoin, uh, if I buy Bitcoin now, and I truly understand the invention, then I know that this is a binary thing. Either the value will go to zero at some time in the future, or it will never stop gaining in value. <laughs> These are the only two options. Right. When you compare it to everything else, since it's absolutely scarce. Uh, I mean, look at the Da Vinci paintings. The a ridiculously ugly one sold for $450 million. <laughs> That's a ridiculous amount of money, and it will probably be more and more valuable as long as it exists. If it arguably it doesn't exist because it has been it has been restored, which means that other painters have painted over it and it's not really Da Vinci anymore. It's like it's like a boat a boat that has the same name but has only one plank left in it. You know, stuff is stuff. It alters like my body it, it have different cells in it than it had when when I was ten years old. I mean, everything changes, but and. If if another coin would take over from Bitcoin, then the people who moved over to that coin, the people who actually did something, like move their coins, trade their coins, will be rewarded. And the hodlers, the one who are, saved their coin and didn't do anything with it, will be punished for not doing anything with it because the price of the next token. And the same thing will be, uh, hold true for the token that took over. So there is nothing. Then we have nothing saying that this can't happen over and over again. Right. So then a, a hodler would need to be not a hodler, but an active trader. And that is not the point here. <laughs> the, this is supposed to incentivize spending, uh, saving rather than spending. This, it's the only thing that makes it different from every other shitcoin, including all the fiat money that we have out there. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the thing. I want this to be able to store value across time and not only across one generation or so. I want it to be like mathematically proven that uh, – uh, that, that, and – yeah, I shouldn't really use the term mathematically here because, as you say, it's a social consensus. And people need to get this and people to need to run their own full nodes and all, all, all of this stuff in order to ensure the, the absolute scarcity aspect of it because it's the only thing that matters. So, uh, so is it fair to characterize that by saying um, another coin could be equally scarce from a technically programmed perspective but the yeah. problem is is the is because and we're we are upholding the scarcity of bitcoin via consensus right yeah yeah so is it fair just to say that if we x uh, like the it choosing v v between among various forms of scarcity is a very slippery slope and basically, it is. we're choosing to maintain this form of scarcity, but if we exercise that choice ever again, then we open up the floodgates and potentially we ruin the whole endeavor. Is that, is that exactly? No, I I believe it's not only potentially. We will ruin the whole endeavor by doing that. Uh, uh, that's like, and there's this is what's so hard about explaining this because there's really nothing to compare it to. We, we never had an event like this, an invention like this. So, so there's really no analogy I can make that uh, that serves its justice. Yeah. In this sense, uh, make any sense? Uh, I, I mean, I, absolutely. The, 
This is one uh, of the things that, that really boils the blood of, of the gold bugs, but it's actually one of the things that I love about Bitcoin because everybody always talks about the tech and the bringing together of these, you know, innovations, you know, that have been worked on for the last 30 years and the network effects and the all this kind of stuff. But I just love that it's all of that and that gives us the opportunity to choose. But the uh, underlying all of this is that like it, it, you is is our choice. So if a transaction yeah. comes through that doesn't uh, uphold, you know, the consensus rules, then I choose to say that's not Bitcoin. And if it does uphold the consensus rules, the rules that I choose that I want from my money, then I say, yeah. OK, that's Bitcoin. And so it's an extremely I don't know if dem democratic may not be the right word, but like it's. It's intentional. We're we're creating the yep. money that we want versus you know gold had was something that we pulled out of the ground and had pretty decent attributes. We said okay, we'll make this our money, but we're like we're really upholding the attributes of the money we want. It's yeah, and I exactly. love that aspect uh, of Bitcoin. This is this is designed to be perfect in that sense. Gold was never designed. <laughs> Not from an atheist perspective, anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway. Uh, Gold, uh, uh, the, no one knows how much of it there there is out there. They just found an asteroid w worth like quantillions of dollars because it's made of gold, basically, and iron and platinum and stuff. And like, so so gold is a hard uh, asset uh, in terms of its stock to flow ratio, but it's still uh, it's still just an asset uh, as any other asset, like oil or uh, silver or whatever. Bitcoin is is absolutely scarce, and the price fluctuations won't uh, won't have an impact on the issuance rates because of the uh, difficulty uh, adjustment. adjustments. Yeah, yeah, and and this is the, it, it makes it truly unique. And if you don't understand, and if you then like, well. These altcoiners and these people—I mean, it's—it—that's the saddest thing, part about this story. Is when when I first got into this, I—I uh, I started to grasp it, and it, it took several steps for me to to get convinced that this was really truly something that I was passionate about. And the the, the final step was uh, the the Segwit 2x uh, rejection and the hard hard fork that never happened there. Uh, like when Bitcoin Cash forked off, in a sense the hard fork happened, but not really because the most underrated part of the protocol, I think, it's the consensus rules. It's the only thing that that ensures this scarcity. So you know, like when, everything else when, is when, copyable. Yeah, and when, when this split happened, uh, it was wasn't the first split, but it was the first split that was really publicly known. Uh, it, all of a sudden, you had. You didn't have 21 million coins. You had <laughs> 42 million coins. Uh, and like, what happens now? Uh, what do I do now? What, what is this? And it forced you to think about these things. And like, is this a Christmas present or is this a train robbery? Right. Like, uh, and uh, it, it is a train robbery, by the way, because uh, like uh, all, all the carts that were full of... <laughs> nothing uh, forked off on another rail and the the ones with the gold uh, <laughs> just uh, rolled on uh, this is the way I, I i see it and as long as we stay humble to this thing and study it and that we allow uh, uh where was where was i was its disappointment thing yeah the uh, there are so many people in this space that i've in some occasions met and uh, in some occasions just listened to on uh, YouTube or whatever that uh, that had a sort of maximalist standpoint but then changed their minds and fell for some trap like I have to issue my own coin now and uh, now I'm going to write a book about this altcoin or whatever. I won't name any names I was going to say, name names, Knut, name names. <laughs> <laughs> But some of the, even some of the biggest names that you thought would never drop, drop the original thing that brought them into this, this, which, which from my point of view was the scarcity aspect of it. But it's it's really t sad to see the amount of uh, 
uh, dishonesty in the space. Uh, uh, like you, you have the brightest and most passionate and most uh, clear-sighted minds in the world, I believe, some, some of the Bitcoin max maximalists. And alongside them, you have all these charlatans and snake oil salesmen in the same room trying to trying to scream louder than each other and it's a very it's a very hard thing for people to do to uh, to uh, to separate the the gold from the uh, what's it called cat's gold fleece gold yeah <laughs> i mean I, uh, I i agree and it's funny i was i watched um who's that is it Michelle Pham, the makeup girl with like a million followers on Twitter who's into Bitcoin? I can't I can't remember her yeah, name. I, I, yeah, I recognize Michelle, that name. Michelle, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But she had Andrew Yang running for president on her podcast recently, right? And it, I only saw the clip, so I don't know the context of the conversation. But I think I think she was basically saying, hey, you're going to give, you know, a thousand bucks to every uh a citizen every month, you know, as a universal basic income. Have you ever thought about doing, you know, that with Bitcoin or integrating Bitcoin in some way? And his response was like, yeah, you know, I thought a lot about cryptocurrency. You know, people in the cryptocurrency are, are like really, uh, you know, really like the UBI concept. And I thought two things. The first thing I thought was like, what the what fucking community are you at? Like, I mean, and yeah. we're in our little Bitcoin <laughs> echo chamber. I know that. But like nobody in Bitcoin thinks UBI is a good idea. But oh. the, the, the other thing is that he like she said Bitcoin, he said cryptocurrency. And, and I feel like, you know, people think yeah. it's all about cryptocurrency until you so that thing happens in your mind where it just clicks and you get it. And you're like, oh, it's it's red, not about red that. Pill, blue pill. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing uh, uh, I wanted to say is like and I'm, I'm a you know, I'm a total maximalist. But if we're talking about free markets, free markets for competition, free markets for everything. And we're, we're, you know, from what I just said, saying we're choosing, you know, via running a node and the, and the certain consensus rules saying anything that comes across my node that has these characteristics is money or is Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And people that are interested in some other altcoin, and let's presume, let's just say it's not a scam if that, if, if, if it exists, but they, they still are saying, the coin with these characteristics, I think, is money, right? Now, the market may be proving them wrong in that their coin has a far lower market cap than, let's say, prime money like Bitcoin. But the same sort of thing is happening. They're looking at the technical attributes of a certain thing, you know, a potential money, and they're saying, um, if it has those attributes, it's money to me. And what they're, I guess, hoping is that other people agree with their definition the the attributes of money that they're willing yeah. to uphold now we would both agree that you know bitcoin is by far ahead in that game and it seems unlikely to be unseated but the same process is is, is happening they're just evaluating yeah. it differently and the the market might prove us wrong right we can't know that for 100 percent sure what we can know is that like we were into history and uh, like opinionated stuff uh, before, and uh, I, I think that all history and all social sciences are uh, opinionated and colored by the the lives of the authors and uh, uh, the systems that and the collective hallucinations that they have been brought up in. Uh, and the the closest thing I ever ever got to uh, to pierce all those veils and like remove all the biases from uh, how a society works is in Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, which boils it down to catalactics and like the the basic premises of uh, premises of why people do stuff at all, what incentives are and what makes people tick what makes people do one thing rather than another thing and what you can and can't know about economics and what conclusions you can draw and like bitcoin is the thing that lured me into that uh, but that has that sort of uh, put words on what i had always had a gut feeling 
was true because I could never really wrap my head around inflation and how inflation was supposed to be a good thing. You hear all these things about the economy needing to grow and without inflation everything will stop moving and like uh, when you when you read Austrians uh, Austrian economics uh, the, the it all makes sense all of a sudden and it's it's like it's like you can finally see uh, through uh, the bullshit and you can see uh, at what levels bullshit are at and what like how much you can know about something like prices for instance are never anything more than historical data a a box of milk in the supermarket has a price tag to it but it doesn't mean that it's val uh, that its actual value is that because it's only worth that when someone comes along and buys it. So uh, there is no such thing as you, you cannot know the value of anything before it's actually transacted with another person. And th 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 this is very important to remember whenever you talk about so societal structures as a whole. And I believe civilization, a civilization is trade like like the first chapter of the book, uh, everything a trade uh, is uh, is about that. That every time we interact with each other, we exchange something, and money is a medium of exchange, but basically just uh, a a linguistic tool in order to express value to each other. And uh, as long as someone has control over that tool and can lie within like here's a hundred dollars this is a hundred dollar bill uh, and someone says it is and someone says that it's worth this and that uh, they're obviously lying because they're not there's no proof there uh, you you can prove that the piece of paper exists but as long as you can't prove the uh, total quantity of the money it's it's really impossible for those who exchange it with each other to to really know its true value and i believe bitcoin is the first shot we have at that that at a specific unit for for storing the the fruits of your labor yeah like i, I, I shouldn't i shouldn't say store value because you can't really store value since value is subjective but you can store the fruits of your labor the fruits of your labor uh, and teleport it through time and not only through space, which is uh, reality now. Like you can get your salary and buy stuff with it, but you can't really store it through time because inflation will eat it all up. And this is what makes the Bitcoin different. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's so interesting to learn about the role of inflation at, and what impact it has on pricing and productivity. And then also to imagine a world in which Bitcoin is that measuring stick or that language or, you know, that that motor oil that lubricates the, the cogs of productivity. And, you know, you put you put shitty motor oil in it, like a currency that's manipulated at source and, and you know, and constantly manipulated. The machine is not going to work efficiently. It's going to need maintenance. It's going to get dirty. It's going to break down. You put very you know you put the best motor oil in it the best lubricant in it and you're going to get the best functioning machine possible the most productive machine the you know the longest lasting machine and so and and you know i've mentioned this on another podcast recently but prices i'm i'm on this big price kick over the last few months because it's such a fascinating thing to me like i wish i could have a piece of art on the wall or something that was like a price a good and a price and then it was like a you know one of those uh, digital picture frames or something, and if you like press the button or walk by, it would just break into every single thing that that came to rep that price is representing you know for that good, because it it would be so much, and so if you're, it it affects our our physical reality in such a real way because if you're man, if if. The, the measuring stick that you're using to and the language you're using to generate those prices is constantly being manipulated and though and every single step along um, all those trades made along the way to produce something are 
are being affected by that manipulation, then the end result you get is going to be affected by that manipulation as well. So what would the world around us look like right now, not assuming any more technological growth or technological advancement, but just with non-manipulatable money and, and more accurate, I guess we could say, pricing? Like how would, the, how would our material lives look different? In some way they would. I don't know. Of course, we don't know what, but... I think uh, one thing about that that we underestimate is how fast prices will go down, because uh, like technology gets better at such a a, a high rate and a, a high pace, mm -hmm. so uh, so that prices, real prices of commodities and what it what it actually means in physical labor to produce something. Uh, goes down so drastically fast. So, uh, like, like, I thought. It, I think if if everyone on Earth was to get into Bitcoin and and uh, try to catch their their share of the uh, total amount of totally scarce tokens, uh, the price would go up uh, in ways we can't even imagine. And like, I I, I believe. It hyper bitcoinization to be a very real thing uh, i'm unsure as to when it happens and like i said before we could also be wrong and the market could disprove us and another coin could take over which would i guess hurt bitcoin uh, for it could potentially hurt bitcoin for a very long time if that happened just because of the the thing i said before about there's not nothing stopping another token from taking over, but I think even in those scenarios, we we maximalists and hodlers should like stick to our guns and try to uh, focus and not lose sight of the goal. Like the, we have already framed our scarce thing. This is the thing we're doing, and this this is the thing we're promoting, and this is the thing we we are proud to uh, to rally behind. Uh, that's the most important thing. Do you think this is what is responsible for the kind of never-ending battle over the narrative, you know, of of each respective, you know, cryptocurrency? But you know, and why people on on uh, aligned with any in, in project in particular are so, you know, passionate and motivated. You got the Bitcoin maximalists, and you got you know, you've got the defenders of of whatever project and i know there's self-interest and all that kind of stuff involved but do you think it's conscious or subconscious that you know on a level people realize that you know choice is the big is the big linchpin here i'm choosing to uphold mm. a set of consensus rules that convey attributes to the money that i want to store my value in and, and use and you know people realize that the narrative that people uh, believe or hear affects the decisions they make, affects their choice. And perhaps that is why there's such a constant, all these debates and all these fights on Twitter and all these battles to sit, you know, to represent Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever in a certain way because of that element of choice that's wrapped up in all of this. Uh, was a question in there somewhere? I, yeah, well, I'm my, sure. <laughs> my question was, do you think that's why people are so you know, and I use the term this probably uh, so adamant, so passionate, so or, or toxic or whatever on on representing anything, Bitcoin, cash, Ethereum, Bitcoin, because yeah, the, yeah, the battle like, for the yeah. narrative is is important. It is. And and like I said before, the space is full of this people to be disappointed in because they they changed their narrative and things got to their heads like. Uh, I wasn't going to name names, but there's an obvious example in Roger Veer. Right. Uh, like the, with the Bitcoin cash for, fork and when he says on this uh, cruise conference somewhere in the Mediterranean that like uh, I'm going to uh, make everyone so rich uh, f from buying this. I did it once with Bitcoin. I'm going to do it again with Bitcoin cash like it was his baby. Right. Like he was the one that made it valuable, and like, uh, and I think unfortunately, being interested in money attracts a lot of psychopaths and a lot of that, uh, like, like really scary people and people who are really egomaniacs, egomaniacs and self-focused like that. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, it's very unfortunate that that they get confused with with the really bright people in this space, like uh, uh, and the really humble people that are focused on entirely different things, like just like just bettering and improving the 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 network, like Peter Willey, for or I can never pronounce his last name, but you know who I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like who are really never stepping on anyone's toes, or just or just in it for. Uh, for the betterment of, of mankind, really, mm-hmm. and I don't know where I fall on that spectrum uh, or where, uh, well, where you I fall mean, on it, but uh, I mean, I guess you have to have some ego to have a drive to do anything at all. I mean, sure, uh, sure, and, and that's so, the balance. You know, that's the that's the dance of life is finding that balance. And and what yeah. the, what what's beautiful about Bitcoin is that it can incentivize the individual and the collective simultaneously. So, you know, you're incentivized to write a book. I don't, you know, whether you make any money from it or you, you gain reputation or you can, yeah, there it is, or you can <laughs> hand it to your neighbor and you get a nice little boost off of that or whatever. And someone compliments you. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's individual, but also your book is going to help educate and inspire and motivate, you know, people all over the world so that, you know, I, and that's why I love the stay humble stack sats meme because yeah. the humble part applies to so many different domains. And um, and that's evident in so many of the projects in the Bitcoin space. I spoke with um, Pavlinex from BTC Pay Server. You know, he does a lot oh, yeah? of the uh, yeah. does a lot of the documentation yeah. and stuff. And, you know, Great guy. And, and BTC Pay Server in general is one of these projects like a lot of people are contributing to a lot of time and energy to it for free. You know, just I love be, the project. Just because it's one they, of the best projects in space. I agree, and and they're doing it because they're like this needs to exist in the world or something like it, and we need to try to create it. And mm. you know, it's worth. I'll take the sacrifice to do it. Yeah. Now, you can't. Do no that one's going to do it for us, right? And, and you can't <laughs> yeah. do it forever, and you need to find ways to make something either commercially viable or have it, you know, support itself in some way. But just the fact that you know people that enter this space are motivated to that degree to contribute is something that I'm always yeah, amazed but, by. Uh, we, we would be dishonest ourselves if we didn't say that like the the promise of an ever increasing Bitcoin price is part of what drives of us. Of course, of course. Uh, but it's it's not a bad thing and it doesn't have to be an egomaniac thing. Uh, uh, by the way, I lost all my Bitcoins in a tragic boating accident. As did I. It was very upsetting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, hurricane season. <laughs> yeah. I live by the water, you know, so it's always yeah. a challenge. I I have uh, I talked with uh, Pierre Ricard about this uh-huh. a couple of weeks ago. It's not released yet that podcast, but there's a movie idea somewhere there with all the <laughs> uh, in the future the divers diving trying to find looking treasures and ledgers. <laughs> yeah, looking for looking for lost Bitcoin from tragic boating accidents. Well, there's and a lot of it somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, but I figured out the the plot twist. They dive down and they stumble on, uh, up on one of those uh, rye stones or whatever they were called that are in all yeah, the Bitcoin yeah, yeah. educational thing. You know, one of those big stones. And this is how far the thought goes. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, you have to work on that. You have to work on that. That's the next book, <laughs> the, the next screenplay or something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I mean, did you have another? Uh, something to say on that thought or were you no, done? No, no, yeah. no, no. So, I mean, now that you're, you know, a published author, you've kind of, I'm sure this has put a lot more attention on you and your family and social circles and community and stuff as like, you know, a Bitcoin expert or the Bitcoin guy or whatever you want to call it. What, you know, do you have more conversations about Bitcoin with people in meat space as a result of this? And how are those conversations going these days as compared to those you had a year ago, two years ago, three years ago? I'm just curious, like what kind of how receptive people are these days? It depends on who you're talking to, of course, on average. And and even even those that I have already convinced about Bitcoin that have some and uh, they they are still very reluctant to like devote time and energy to learn more about it mm-hmm. and to study it which i think in and like if you really care about this uh, like uh, 
that's the obvious way to go and you like need to you need to sooner or later you're going to need to know how to use a hardware wallet sooner or later after that you're going to need to know how to run your own full node and you're going to need to edu- you're going to ed- have to educate yourself and there's still there are still very big hurdles there because this is not easy to understand for a lot of people mm-hmm. uh First of all, like we said before, you have to have this curious mind and uh, that is willing to take mental leaps and think out of the box. And you also have to know a bit about computers, a bit about cryptography and quite complicated maths, uh, a little of everything. Uh, what is it? Is there anything that, uh, with regards to Bitcoin, that like on your education in it, that you're like what's your main area of focus or what's the frontier of your kind of understanding of, of Bitcoin these days? What are you trying to understand better about Bitcoin? Mm, I would like to have more time on my hands <laughs> to, uh, to, to get to know all, all of it. Uh, I'm still, still trying to, to learn the, 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 basics of the protocol really my uh, uh, contributing author on, on the book Kalle Rosenbaum uh, uh, wrote a book called Grokking Bitcoin you know that I've heard of it I haven't read An- it uh, another Swede it's a technical book I have it somewhere uh, not lying around here not now unfortunately but uh, he he likes br- breaks down the entire technology the whole Bitcoin core program from like uh, uh, he, he there's an analogy about a cookie token being created and what you need to create the cookie token and why the different steps of the protocol evolved into what they are now right now and all the way down to SegWit and Lightning Network and all that and I'm I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that and like. I was intimidated by Jimmy Song's book, uh, Programming Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, so I thought that someday I'm going to comprehend all of this, but I have to take it step by step. And like uh, the thing I did the last few months was studying more Austrian economics because I, I really think you need you need that perspective to know the to know the why uh, the why is that that's why you should learn more about how the technology works because I think you should. Uh, understand they, uh, there are so many aspects of this and so many angles to attack it from so I, I try to I try to li- I listen to a lot of Bitcoin podcasts I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks uh, about different things uh, so I, I can't really say that I'm focused on one specific part of Bitcoin right now to learn about I'm curious about uh, curious about all of it and I have my Twitter flow and I try right. to Read it, read and listen to as much as I can, basically. Yeah. What have, speaking of all the different angles that this can be attacked from, I, I don't, I don't mean it like I mean approached in terms of understanding. Um, it, in people that you have spoken with, what do you find is the thing that's most compelling to people in terms of stimulating further curiosity to understand more? You know, so a lot of people after Safe's book came out. The, the idea of um, absolute scarcity was a concept that really, you know, seemed to ignite a lot of people's curiosity and kind of allow them to see how special this, this thing was. Is there anything in particular in terms of that sort of angle that you found that people are interested in when you're speaking with them? Uh, not really. Uh, I can't say. Can't say. <laughs> Do you have uh, many I, conversations with people about Bitcoin? No, uh, um, more or less, not not, not, in not on this deeper level. Right. Like I, I, I have casual conversations about it all the time, but it's very rare to to hear someone having actually, like, try tried to to understand this and to, and like even finding a person that different different differentiates bitcoin from uh, altcoins and uh, cryptocurrencies is hard to find i mean people read newspapers and they read they think that what 
what the newspaper says has something to do with reality and uh, <laughs> uh, they they it like i said the the collective hallucination part of it is very hard to wrap your head around and like isn't that illegal but what if you can't pay taxes and if you can uh, move uh, the, that sounds like a tool for criminals and like yeah but uh, who are the real criminals here and uh, so on and so on people are reluctant to think these things right. and uh, and uh, rightfully so, because they, they're scared of, they're intimidated, intimidated by the yeah. forces, the violent forces in the systems they live in. And not only the uh, the states and the nations and the police forces, but, but also like uh, there's a certain risk to doing this for you and me to admit to uh, like some people might not believe that we have actually been in boating accidents yeah. <laughs> and we might have uh, uh, find ourselves in a, a situation where we're threatened by someone mm -hmm. and like and uh, yeah it's a, it's a scary thing and i think a lot of people are scared off by all by all of this like there's no there's no real good on and off ramps that that are uh, anonymous or private, like uh, uh, it's still a, very much in its infancy. infancy sure. And I think people expect technologies to like take over the world in one and a half year right, right now. They expect WhatsApp or Uber or something like that. They accept, expect technologies to to uh, to have a very short uh, onboarding mechanism. And what, what they don't realize is that th this is not to be compared to Uber or uh, Uber or Spotify or Airbnb or WhatsApp or whatever. This is, uh, this is like to be compared with the internet and it's even bigger than the internet. And it's even, and people have a very hard time understanding that, that this is an in invention that is it it cannot be compared to even Google uh, uh, or uh, or Facebook. This is some something completely different. It's not a company, and it doesn't have any marketing, and it grows organically, and it will take time, and it's hard to understand. And uh, like, but personal security through mathematics. <laughs> It's hard to understand. Sorry, but like well, if it's you... a worldview change. You know, it's not <laughs> yeah, just uh, it you know Facebook. It started as uploading your photos to the internet. Well, you already took photos. You already like to share them with your friends. So this just gave you an easier way to do it. Uh, Bitcoin is a worldview change. It's it's a total. Yeah. It's the you know a total reversal of kind of responsibility. You delegated yeah. responsibility externally before. Now you're having you're taking you have to it to do it all yourself, yeah. Yeah, so that's a big that's a big uh, step for a lot of people to take. Yeah. And it's it's compelling for true rebels and uh, <laughs> individualists uh, but I I think scary to us as well because uh taking all the responsibility yourself it's 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 a huge burden of course mm -hmm. uh, like do you want to, to be in the driver's seat of your life well <laughs> the traffic is sort of scary and like you don't really know how the car works and <laughs> do you really want to be in the passenger seat so would you like the um you know it, it, when you're saying that it brings to mind you know something i played uh, basketball for the high my team in high school yeah and i remember my first i think i only played my, my freshman year, I think. Um, but I remember, you know, when I first started, I was, you know, I was nervous, just got to high school, you know, I, you know, it was a new school for me. So I was just, you know, nervous, nervous kid. And uh, I remember like one of the first games I played, my teammate passed it to me. I was beyond the three point line. And like, I just was out of my comfort zone. Right. And the coach of the opposite team said, press him. He doesn't want the ball. Like, he's scared of the ball. He's scared of the ball. Like, you know, if you press him, he'll probably make a mistake. And I remember after the game, I was, like, really down about that. I was like, man, I don't want the ball. Like, I, I can't handle that responsibility. I don't want to take the shot. I don't want to. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I got over it, and, and life went on, and I, I adapted. But 
that's very much the same thing I think that you were just describing the analogy of the, the driver's seat. Like, yeah. do, you, do you want the ball? Do you want to be in control and the responsibility required with that and the education and the skills and the, and the, the stillness of mind and all the other things that are required to do so in the most optimized way? Do you want that responsibility? Uh, exactly. And it's like it's like when we when we started this conversation, you asked me if I wanted to have video on. I was scared to do that, but then I, then I thought about uh, Taleb again and like skin in the game, that, that whole thing, and like which by the way is an excellent book. I the first time I read it, I didn't really like it, but it's been on my mind ever since, like because it, uh, having skin in the game is such a powerful 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 thing and and it makes me dare to do stuff i mean like uh, uh one of my huge influences is john cleese the comedian yeah and there, there's uh there's a, a stand-up show uh that he did like five or ten years ago uh where he talks about his upbringing and the town he grew up in called weston super mayor and he says that everyone in that town seemed like their main goal in life was to get safely into their coffins without ever having been seriously embarrassed. <laughs> and, and that <laughs> stuck a note with me because so like, true. Uh, uh, I can't go on like being so harsh on myself all the time and having uh, like uh, not daring to, to speak my mind to, to uh, throw my name out there. And that's what made me write stuff about Bitcoin in the first place. And like, it forces you, uh, like having your 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 name out there and like being a part of something and ha being judged by other people. Uh, uh, it, it forces you to do your best, and it forces you to to uh, to deliver in a in a in a whole. Yeah, the better stuff uh, will come out of you if you I, if you have skin in the game. I totally agree, uh, and I you know I very much that very much resonates with me. But I think those two points especially are, are so uh, so important in that um, you know if you you do something regardless of the fear of reputation or feedback or judgment. Not only is that a courageous move, and not only are you emboldened by the act yeah. of doing it, but it also focuses your energy because you want to try to mitigate the degree to which uh, anything that's in your control will contribute to that being like considered a uh, like a mistake or, or a bad move. So once mm -hmm. you make that leap, your focus just narrows, and you know, yeah. and you, you, so you do your best, and but you also accept the outcome, and that's. You know that's the balance of the two the two things. Yeah, that's that's why I love having these conversations. They're intimidating at first, but w when you get used to it, and you need a couple of them, and you need a, a you need some time to uh, to get something out of it and to get your brain going. And like, there's so much uh, superficial stuff out there, and people are so concerned with likes and retweets and whatever it is, and subscribers and so on. And and terrified of being called uh, bad things. Yeah. <laughs> Every, that that like motivates most of the people that are on the internet, and it's 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 a sad thing. And their uh, honesty is a rare commodity. And I think we need long conversations like this like w where we just sit and talk and we'll see how how long it takes and we we'll just let the conversation flow naturally uh that's where honesty comes from like you need to get to know the other person a bit before before you can get something absolutely and you know what real. I, I think that and this of course is strange whenever we talk about behavioral changes as a result of a digital protocol but i feel like bitcoin has emerged as this thing that um, gives people something to be courageous for, you know? So not yeah. on, not only yeah. is it like, you know, you derive courage because you know you got like the big kid in the school backing you up and you're like, you know, come on, let's let's do it. But you it's like it it draws out 
it just allows you to be courageous and you the kind of the way it in, in it gets into your head is like this thing that i'm trying to both understand and represent is worth me being courageous for and you know some people on bitcoin twitter yeah. even take it as far as saying me even sacrificing myself for it now yeah. not you know yeah. not hopefully physically but like if it takes me falling flat on my face trying to you know talk about or argue for or explore these concepts then fuck it i'm going to i'm going to do it and that's a cur courage that probably nothing else previous or very few things previously in their life at least in their intellectual or professional life inspired them to do yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I would, what is that lyrics? Uh, that lyric from Queens of Stone Age. Uh, I want, I want something good to die for to make it beautiful to live. Right. <laughs> That's beautiful. There, there, there's yeah. some, yeah. There's something in there. So speaking of which, and and I'm gonna move into the rapid fire in a second here now, but, you know. With all that being said, why'd you, you know, what was the motivation for, for writing the book? You know, what, what was okay. the spark that you're just like, I got to do this? Okay, that's, that's, it's sort of a long story. Okay. Uh, give I, me, I think give I me the condensed version. <laughs> a, a condensed version. I was bored at work, so I started, uh, uh, as usual, so I started to, uh, uh, I, started to fall into the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And then I took one of the, uh, excuse me, uh, online courses at the University of Nicosia, uh, where Andreas Antonopoulos was one of the teachers. Uh, 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 this was back in 2016, I believe. Uh, and uh, I, I've graduated from that and got my diploma on the blockchain. Uh, <laughs> stored forever on the Bitcoin blockchain and whatever in, <laughs> in a hash there in a message and uh, 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 then I thought now now I have this th more knowledge than most people about this and I'm still curious about it and I'd like to do something for it and I'd like to do something in the space I started writing about it when I was really bored at work I had a, even more boring work <laughs> so I started writing and then I wrote an article called casual beat Bitcoin users, you need to know about August 17th, uh, which was when the uh, hard fork happened to Bitcoin Cash. And the article is basically a guide as to how to get your uh, private keys, which you couldn't get from like Coinbase or Blockchain.info back then, like very easily. You had to, you, you had to do, know a bit more than that. So it's just just a simple guide as to how to get your private keys in order to not miss out on the opportunity of the uh, uh, the uh, airdrop from uh, from Bitcoin Cash, and that article got seventy thousand reads, <laughs> so so it went sort of viral, mm. and that happened one time earlier in my life with a music video we did with an old band uh, of mine. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I've really seen the potential of things going viral before. So I thought, like, uh, if if this can happen to me uh, twice, uh, th there is something here, and I can do something with it. So I start. So I wrote more articles, and I just just did it for my own. Um, just because I wanted to, I wanted to test myself how how good I could make them, and like uh, how. how what level of language, uh, uh, what level of English can I uh, come up to? It's you know, it's it's not my first language, so uh, there, there's a there's another thing to to like test myself there. Mm -hmm. And so I started, so I so I did that some more, and uh, and then I thought, how about I compile these articles into a book? <laughs> uh, and so I did that, and. Uh, uh, released it myself on Amazon, all DIY uh, thing to do, and uh, then I had that book. But that was just articles, and they were sort of old. And they began with my first article, and I, w I wasn't very pleased with the the end result. I thought uh, if if I could write a a book of articles, I, I 
I could write a proper book as well. That's something to be like to put my name on and be proud of and like really uh, that I myself would like to market and like do something with. So I started so as a new New Year's resolution uh, a year ago now. I uh, I said to myself I'm going to write a page a day uh, until I have something to publish. Originally, I thought I would write for a year and have like 365 pages to publish. But when I got to about 100 pages, I I, I felt like if I if I uh, continue now, I will just repeat myself and I I'm sort sort of. Uh, the flow stopped. The creative flow stopped. So, uh, so I thought I'll, I'll release this and I'll see what happens with it. And of course, it needed a lot of proofreading, and I got help from the community really fast. And like people liked it, but like you could rephrase this and rephrase that. So I had some really good inputs uh, from Kalle Rosenbaum, for instance, for some of the technical stuff in it. Uh, he uh, he has much more knowledge than I do on the technical side of this. So. So I uh, I published the second edition, uh, which is the one that is out now, and uh, uh, I I listened to it on like with a, a robot voice and uh, uh, when I was out jogging uh, a couple of times, and I really liked the sound of I uh, <laughs> you're happy about it. I like uh, I sound really smart in this. I, maybe I could <laughs> like so uh, so uh, I. I bought. Uh, I brought uh, 50 books to Riga to the Baltic Honey Badger Conference, and uh, sold half of them and gave half of them away. Uh, all of them gone during the conference, and uh, after that, and up until this point, a lot of a lot of opp opportunities have opened up for me, and it, it played out way better than I could ever have imagined like uh, uh, I'm on I'm on Bitcoin only I'm on Bitcoin resources I'm on Bitcoin intro and uh, a couple of other websites now as one of the essential Bitcoin books I've only got five star reviews like seven of them on Amazon on different countries and uh, like uh, uh, I'm I'm going to be in one uh, beginner's box of Bitcoin things, and uh, it's an audio book. Uh, uh, like as you mentioned, Guy Swan's podcast, there I really enjoy that, and I really enjoyed his comments. And uh, he's such a good has such a good voice for it too, so it's really he's, sweet to listen to. He's the best. He's yeah, the best. and uh, yeah, I'm so glad that everyone seems to like it and. So like this guy Dan Tapiero uh, endorsed it, and he he likes has a, a gold hedge fund in New York or something. Is <laughs> one of these real big macro players. So, so is so it is it selling is it selling well like on Amazon? Yeah, it is. Uh, I sell books every day. I, uh, I found it a very like accessible and you know very good overview of of what bitcoin is right obviously you don't get too lost in the technical weeds anywhere but just a nice nice concise overview but i have a question yeah, for you yeah. um and i think and this is not in any way an insult but i think we would all agree that the bitcoin rabbit hole is endless right and there's probably yeah. many things that you and i and everybody in the space does not understand about bitcoin so when you put out a book or you know same could be asked of me when i put out a, co a podcast or anything in which you're discussing this thing do you have any and this is relevant to our you know courage this you know conversation earlier but yeah are you at all apprehensive that your ignorance would be exposed if you when you put yourself out there in an attempt to explaining something that is so complex not your general ignorance but your aspects of your ignorance in relation to a, that particular subject like do you have any re reservations yeah. there or terrified and excited at the same time <laughs> <laughs> because uh, like winning is about being knocked down and getting up again I love uh, it. like, I love uh, it's it. a cliche but like uh, I'm not perfect safety is not perfect Andreas Antonopoulos is not perfect. No one is perfect uh, in this space. And uh, we all need uh, feedback. We all need to be criticized and like uh, uh, in order to better ourselves. And like I, I want to, if there's if there are any inaccuracies or anything in the book, I, I really like to know because uh, 
please debate me and please try to knock my arguments down because this this is the this is the only way to grow, and I, I uh, this is what I like about the Bitcoin community: the the, the brutal honesty of the max uh, of the toxic ma maximalists. The, it's like uh, either you get it or you don't. Uh, but if you don't, it's okay if you can admit that you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, uh, so, uh, but. Uh, I write in the uh, after thoughts here in the book. I think something about that: uh, all opinions, political or not, express, expressed in this book are first and foremost meant to be thought-provoking and are not meant to be taken too literally. Mm -hmm. That's a little <laughs> safe out there. Right, right, right. That little <laughs> sentence at the end. So I don't like it, it's it's meant to uh, to make people think rather than to make people listen to me and my opinions about stuff it's like maybe this can trigger a thought in your brain and you can you can elaborate on that and you can think for yourself it's it's not it's not about listening to me specifically uh, because that's not what bitcoin is about is it it's yeah. like bitcoin is decentralized and there's no leader there's no thought leader there's not there's no uh, i think about the scene in life of brian where <laughs> uh Brian's followers. Uh, he, Brian says to his followers, "You're all different," and the the crowd goes, "Yes, we're all different." <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> like this is, you shouldn't try to follow a leader. You should try to think for yourself. That's the whole point of the "don't trust, verify" attitude, and and why we why we Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's super well put, and I've actually been both thinking about. Uh, this in relation to my own output and also kind of not advocating for it, but talking about it a bit more on the podcast in that, like, I think, well, maybe I have been advocating for it because I think that people should, wherever they're at on the rung, on the ladder of understanding Bitcoin. And as you said, as long as you come at it with humility, I don't think people are going to criticize you too harshly where you're at on the ladder. They may have feedback. They may, you know, they may help you along your way. But as long as you're, you know, you've got that humility as a uh, as a foundation, then I think people are going to be pretty, no. pretty uh, forgiving. And I'd like to see, you know, more people just express their their understanding and their enthusiasm and their motivations for being interested and involved in this space, whether it's through podcasts, writing, video, speaking, mm. whatever. Not only because I think that's a great way to learn. And not only because I think everyone share like there's a lot of people that are on your level and that re that re that re respond and resonate to the way that you speak and communicate and the way I speak and mm. communicate and everybody yeah. else. So you're always somewhat like focusing the lens a bit because your way of communicating is a little bit different than somebody else's. But I also think it's a great way for that kind of serendipitous way of mining your own understanding for little nuggets or insights that you wouldn't have otherwise yeah. found so like if no, you get exactly i say uh, it, i get ideas yeah well, so well, if, if, if you get up on a stage right or you sit down like with your computer in front of you and you're trying to write like you will probably ideas will coalesce whether on the page or out through your mouth in ways that you haven't articulated before maybe you didn't even like yeah, because you force you force yourself to become creative, exactly. like and to think creative thoughts and like to be on the spot and like like this conversation, for instance, like I have to come up with stuff all the time here, and then, like <laughs> this is the third podcast I'm doing now in in a short while, and this is the flow is so much better in this conversation. Than <laughs> <the two. laughs> well, like, but that's the point, right? Everybody has their yeah. own. Everybody has their own style, and and and. Certain people will like other styles and certain people like this one. But I just think, you know, and that's why I think people like Andreas and, and like those people that you see where they're getting up and you can tell that they're not reciting a prearranged speech. They're literally thinking Improvise. fresh. Yeah, they're improvising yeah. and they're having fresh thoughts and insights at the moment that they're articulating them to whomever, the page, the audience, anything like that. Jordan Jordan Peterson's another one. Yeah. Now, like, yeah, you know, yeah. He's pretty polarizing. Yeah. Say what you want about yeah. him, but he gets up on stage in front of thousands of people and it's not like he has a prearranged speech. He has a, a deep understanding of a subject matter and a deep passion in it 
and a deep curiosity for it, yeah. that he just gets up on stage and allows himself the latitude and the freedom to try to articulate it in the way that's most truthful at that moment in time to him and the way that's most clear yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah. And something yeah. new always emerges. And I like I think we should all be maybe experimenting yeah. with that a little bit more. And if I could get to, to that point uh, when, when <laughs> speaking to uh, like someone like yourself or in public or whatever, uh, that, that that's a good goal to aim for, to be a good thought jazz musician, if you like. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I, I like, like that. A, yeah, improvising, improvising creativity. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, parallels to music there. And uh, I really like that. I like the, the spur of the moment and the, the train of thought. Uh, well, I think, uh, I think it's partially because that's the most genuine reflection of the current state of your understanding. If I'm regurgitating a speech that I know works yep. okay, but it's from six yep. months ago, it's not It's not genuine. But if I just get up on stage and I say, okay, subject matter, Bitcoin. Audience, yeah. like, you yeah. know, 120 year olds. All right, go, yeah, it, what comes out? It also forces you to uh, to wrap your head around sure. many more aspects of it. And my, because you wouldn't want to, and no one wants to make a fool out of themselves. So. You better be prepared. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, Knut, I'm gonna hit you with some rapid fire questions now. I don't know if yeah. you've 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 checked out the show before, but basically, I'll just yeah, uh, have. I'll just say out a question, and you give me however long or short a response as you like. And then once yeah. those are done, I'm gonna finish with some word associations, where I just say a word, and you shoot out the first thing that comes to your mind. Yeah, this is this is what we're talking about just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, hit me. And these are actually, I've, I've a lot of these are new, so this is the first time I've tried them out. So you're, uh, yeah, what uh, a, what a what a yeah. privilege. <laughs> uh, I'm the I'm the test rabbit. You're the guinea the pig, yeah. Hole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, but the first one I couldn't let go of, so we'll just get started with that. And the first one is, what is money? Money is a linguistic tool. Uh, that we use in order to express value to each other. If you had to explain Bitcoin to a 10-year-old, what would you say? Uh, absolute scarcity on the internet that you can teleport uh, something along those lines. I would. A 10-year-old. I have an 8-year-old here. Uh, this answer is too long already. I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, these these, these ones these ones you can take your time if you need, but um, uh, I I would I would uh, try to trigger their curiosity somehow. How, Don't know how. How will you know if Bitcoin has failed? <laughs> uh, uh, there will be zeros everywhere on every screen. <laughs> Not preceded by ones. Um, exactly. <laughs> what does Bitcoin, quote unquote, Bitcoin success look like to you? Uh, it looks just like it's looking right now. Uh, uh, I have no complaints. <laughs> you have one resource, book, article, singular podcast, episode, website, whatever, to refer someone who is just coming to Bitcoin. What is it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I meant to write in for this one in particular. It can't yeah, be your yeah. own book, but no, yeah, they, this could only be in, done on in, video. In addition, in addition to sovereignty through mathematics, what is the one? Uh, it's a hard question. Uh, probably the Bitcoin Standard by Seyfedina Moose. Yeah. What other investments? Or oh, like uh, maybe uh, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. That takes uh, about four days to finish thicker. the audiobooks. <laughs> <laughs> so. What other investments are you interested in, if any? Uh, my education, my family, my... Uh, Yeah, I wouldn't say any other uh, like assets or stock or whatever or company. Uh, that's a lame answer. I'd, I'd say <laughs> invest in yourself Agreed and totally. your family. What's one piece of advice you'd give to someone just entering the space, just at the beginning of the rabbit hole? 
buy now rather than later. <laughs> what movie or song is most related to Bitcoin in your opinion? <laughs> the thing that popped to mind was You're Simply the Best by Tina Turner. <laughs> 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 that's a good one man that's a good that's that's probably the best ever for that one uh i'm gonna be thinking about that for a while now um can bitcoin be stopped if so what is bitcoin's biggest vulnerability if not why not uh we we we, we talked about this earlier yeah like i think uh, uh another cryptocurrency taking over the pole position is a very very real and very very scary uh, attack vector what is something about bitcoin you don't understand very well uh, <laughs> schnorr signatures <laughs> Uh, some of the technicalities, uh, I mean, I, I find my head, uh, um, uh, find it hard to wrap my head around some, some of the technical aspects. But I, I, I think I'll get there. Uh, 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 the the mathematics is not impossible, but uh, yeah, there, there's there are so many answers to this question. Uh, like. Uh, most of it, I would say, and uh, I would say that goes for mo everyone else as well. I mean, it's it's a very, it's a one-time thing. It's very hard to wrap your head around, and it's very hard to, it's very easy to be arrogant and uh, not humble about it. Uh, I mean, m yeah. What is mathematics? <laughs> What kind of question is that? Can I go to Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> I was I put it in there. I wasn't looking for like the uh, dictionary uh, definition, but maybe in an abstract sense. If I that helps at all. <laughs> mathematics is a way of uh, it's um, uh, it, it's real. I'll take it. When, if ever, do you think the first central bank will start adding Bitcoin to the reserves? And do you think they'll exist in 20 years? The central banks? Yeah. That's, if central banks will exist in 20 years? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the first central bank has already added Bitcoin to their reserves. I, I have no clue about the amount, but... Uh, then again, the, 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 uh, there's a philosoph uh, philosophical uh, thing there. Uh, a central bank, w what is a central bank? It's a collection of humans, and uh, but there's one on top having power over the others as long as he follows a certain set of rules. So uh, uh, a central bank is, in my opinion, not a an entity that can own a Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, make any sense yeah <laughs> like like you you have uh, like how would that work would you have uh, a multi-sig of the entire institution uh, and uh, different uh, layers uh, you would you would have to like program the entire central banking hierarchical structure into a multi-sig agreement of some kind I don't believe we'll ever see that I do believe how however that central bankers as individuals this is about individuals uh, and not collective uh, entities. Uh, they already own Bitcoin, I'm sure. And uh, I do believe that the institution, the central bank, will exist in 20 years. Uh, and I do believe that they are a fix fictitious construct of our uh, collective hallucination bullshit type of <laughs> sect cult thing. <laughs> Got it. What is yeah. the biggest mistake you've made with Bitcoin? Getting into an argument with Eric Voiskull. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I hear you. What has been the hardest part about adopting Bitcoin for you? About adopting it? Yeah, as like what's been the hardest part? You know, securing it or purchasing it or has there been anything that's been particularly challenging? Uh, w w when the when the airdrop happened and uh, getting uh, getting a hold of your own uh, like this is this is a while ago now but like wrapping your head around that and uh, selling at the right time and selling without uh, a risk of losing your coins and all like that was hard uh, that's been a couple of other things uh, uh, yeah, I have to mention that one as well uh, uh, using a hammer and a nail in order to get uh, <laughs> almost double digit bitcoin out of an open dime that was not mine <laughs> really uh, and putting them on a hardware wallet for a friend wow um, uh, uh that that was scary and hard uh and uh thinking about taxation and uh what to admit and what to not admit and like i a, a scary thought like in sweden we have something called a uh, omvänd bevisbörda that means like uh i had to say the word in order to translate it properly like it, you have to prove yourself innocent rather than that they have to prove you guilty if you're uh, if they charge you with an economic crime you have to prove that you're not guilty of it and i've given that a lot of thoughts but haven't really come up with a solution in in my opinion i haven't ever committed an economic crime but like in Sweden, I think you're supposed to pay taxes for the coins you got out of the airdrop from from whatever fork, and uh, you're supposed to declare all that. And uh, like I, I've given that a lot of thought. Um, that seems like what a pretty do in the scary law that the state can just charge is, you with any sort of economic crime, and you have to yeah, prove your innocence draconian as hell and th this country the the longer i live in it and the the more i understand about it and its laws the scarier it gets unfortunately what have you learned about yourself or how have you changed if at all as a result of learning about and interacting with bitcoin uh, like i said skin in the game like uh not being afraid of educating yourself uh, even when you're 40 and like uh, trying to wrap your head around something and trying to um, actually admit to yourself that you might be suit well suited to articulate stuff about uh, quite a complicated subject. Uh, uh, it helped my self-esteem a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. That's pretty common. Um, what is your most controversial or contrarian view or opinion? If nothing on Bitcoin, any subject is okay. Uh, I, I think this whole uh, section of my book that views... Uh, uh, Bitcoin as a, a as an expression of atheism is uh, is controversial to some uh, because I know a lot of a lot of right wingers in in the U.S. for instance like like Bitcoin a lot, but uh, quite a lot of them are quite religious at the same time, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think I alienate uh, I have alienated uh, a certain amount of potential readers or followers that way uh, other controversial views uh, I don't know ballpark estimate of Bitcoin's price in five years 
ballpark estimate of Bitcoin's price in five years? Mm -hmm. uh, a million dollars. Do you have a morning routine? If so, what is it? I try to exercise for seven minutes every morning. <laughs> uh, what do you I do? For, what do you do oh, for those seven minutes? Uh, Thirty seconds of each uh, type of exercise, and like I a, try to do this twice a day. Like and, a high intensity uh, interval thing. Yeah, a high, yeah. A high intensity thing. I, uh, I've, I've only done it for. Uh, like half a year or something now uh, so it's not really uh, i mean i should have taken more care of my body and back uh, when i was younger but better what, late than never what inspired <laughs> what inspired the shift the change um me becoming slightly fat <laughs> i guess um <laughs> uh, a book not your own and my wife my my wife inspired uh, <laughs> a book that's not your own that you've gifted most if if at all that i've gifted yeah have you ever gifted like books to people oh, like yeah have you ever, have you ever I, gifted I, books i'm not you? i'm not that good at gifting books <laughs> but if i would recommend uh books to other people uh, I, I always say that you only need two books, and that is 1984 by George Orwell and The Emperor's New Clothes, the kid's book by uh, H. Hans Christian Andersen. Very good. <laughs> uh, in the future, this is a, a question I picked up from a former guest. In the future, when Bitcoin hits, let's say, a million dollars, what are you going to spend your Satoshis on that will benefit you and or society? A very very good question uh but i hope my grandchildren would spend my satoshis and not me i i you, you can view this as a as a means of uh uh knighting your children like like with the old feudal lords they could like they could pass on power across time and across generations by saying you're a king now, or you're a prince now, or you're the duke of whatever. And now everyone can do that by simply handing over their private keys to their uh, to their offspring. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, what is one question you'd like to see added to this list? What's the meaning of life? <laughs> That's the second time someone has said that. Uh, okay. The, uh, I think uh, the Hitchhiker's Galaxy got it sort of right. It's In the Hitchhiker's Galaxy, it's 42, but it's actually half of that. I asked that question. So a guest gave me that question, and then I asked it to, I think, Stefan Levera. And then he said the answer. his answer was 42. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually 21 <laughs> okay last part this is the word association part so I'll just say a word you you tell me the first thing that comes to your mind yeah. democracy bullshit the lightning network uh, awesome the corporation uh, uh, entity <laughs> human rights uh, fictitious choice Yes, please. Violence. Uh, free speech. Ego. Uh, Roger Veer. <laughs> I've gotten that answer. I've gotten that answer before too. <laughs> uh, consensus. Uh, important. Wealth. Uh, 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 subjective digital reality uh, uh, reality privacy F fungibility hate speech no such thing gold metal guns Violence. Revolution. 
evolution. Socialism. Uh, there's just darkness here. <laughs> Family. Uh, importance. Inequality. Doesn't matter. Hell. Metal music. Liberty. Uh, sovereignty. Energy. Mass. <laughs> and finally, Bitcoin. Uh, sovereignty. What was that? Obviously. What was the Tina Turner song you you said again? For the You're last... simply the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, well, Knut, this has been awesome, man. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. I know it's getting late there, 10, 10 30, something like that. So I should let yeah, you Yeah, I don't mind. I should let no, you go. Yeah. Um, I enjoy this a lot. Thanks thanks so much for just taking the initiative. And, oh, man. My, my pleasure. We'll, we'll definitely do it again in, in six to 12 months. And hopefully, you know, before too long, we'll be able to meet each other in person at the conference or something. But um, yeah. did Are you, you wanna... planning on going to Europe anytime soon? I, have, I don't have any plans on the table yet, but we'll see how next year materializes. Materializes. I think next year. I've I've never been to any sort of Bitcoin conference, but I think next year will maybe be the year that I I dip my toes in the water. Um, yeah, I promised myself to go to Riga again, but I have nothing else planned. I heard Riga was, was amazing. It was, it, yeah. and so many uh, so many uh, excellent people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it must must be so cool just to meet all these people that you've interacted with on Twitter, and you know, you you know, you share so much in common in terms of yeah, and you, you have know. Uh, you have a whole you have a whole weekend, and in some cases they have a whole week, so uh, all the barriers are dropped, uh, and you feel like you're with your family in a sense. That's so awesome, man. Yeah. Um, is there anywhere you wanted to direct people if they want to find out more, buy the book, you know, contact you, anything uh, like that? Uh, I can just say the book is available on uh, on Amazon in English and German at the moment. Selbstbestimmung durch Mathematik, translated by a guy called Volker Herminghaus, uh, who is a uh, I've said this before, and he finds it funny. He's a machine <laughs> in terms of he's very efficient. He's uh, well, translated he's, stuff he's all the time. He's a German after all, so no surprise yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and uh, it's also available in Finnish uh, by another machine called uh, Thomas Brand, uh, uh, who's also translated safety. And uh, it's uh, a Russian version is coming out. And a German audiobook version, and you can look it all up and uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to, uh, if you want to get the news about <laughs> whenever your language uh, gets added <laughs> to this list. And uh, the I think the best way of uh, uh, of reading my book is to listen to it on Guy Swan's podcast, uh, The Crypt Economy, and it's episode three hundred and eight. Uh, and he reads the entire book in five episodes and he comments on each chapter afterwards and his comments are as interesting as the book itself i think yeah yeah his his commentary <laughs> yeah. i always love it but you know on, on the book especially it was great so i totally recommend and you and guy did a podcast as well if you're looking for more uh yeah, did, more did content you hear that? after that i did yeah of course uh, yeah um well, look, man, thanks again. I uh, Until we meet uh, again in digital space or meet space, I wish you all the best. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you in the future. Same to you. Uh, um, <laughs> I was trying to find the Japanese word for thank you. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, brother. Take care. Uh, yeah, take care. Bye. See ya.